Okay, so this is part three of our Zeitgeist rebuttal, uh, 102807. And this next last part is the refutation of Akarsha X's book, Akarsha S's book, The Christ Conspiracy, by Mike Lycona. Now, this is from www.answeringinfidels.com. Now, this guy, what he does is he goes up there and he refutes a lot of people in a biblical sense um, that have taken. Um, uh, shots at Christianity and things of this nature. Now, the one thing about it that I don't agree with these supposed scholars that do this, although he does a good job here, he does. They none of them ever have a comprehension of what the Bible is. They don't ever, you know, they'll use NIV and all these other translations. So essentially, what I've tried to do in this is is go in there and cut out any of the of the uh, Bible verses that are um, where they actually. I'm, I'm actually cutting and pasting them out of there, and I'm just leaving you the Bible reference so you can go read it, okay? Um, so, this is from him, and uh, this is just excerpts from this article. This this is so voluminous, this is so huge, there's so many references, there's over well over 100 references in this one article alone, okay? So, I'm just going to try to hit the high points, okay, on this. Akarsha S., who wrote The Christ Conspiracy, which is what the Zeitgeist movie is based on, Okay, Karsha S. is a skeptic with an interest in mythology who has written the book, The Christ Conspiracy, the greatest story ever sold. No, what she's selling is probably one of the greatest fallacies ever sold. This book represents a, an hypothesis of how Christianity came into being. Although it has received no attention from scholarship, with the lone exception of a negative book review, and that from an atheistic scholar, how much worse can you get? Even the atheists... Don't even buy it. The Christ conspiracy has nonetheless gained support from a number of laypersons. The occasion for this paper is to amass Murdoch's amass is to assess Murdoch's major claims in a brief manner in the terms of their accuracy and whether her book is a worthwhile contribution on the origin of Christianity. In other words, I believe her that's not a real name, Acacia S. Murdoch is actually part of her real name. Okay, so this is what we're trying to do here. We're, we're trying to see is this really a worthwhile contribution to the origin of Christianity? Is this Christ conspiracy? The paper will sample some of her major claims in this book. No attempts will be made to defend the Christian worldview. Okay, in other words, the the information will speak for itself. Okay, the, the information is just going to speak for itself without even having to, to defend the Christian worldview. Of course, I'll do that. But I think in order, he's trying to be objective here is the point of this. Akarsha, which is what she refers to herself, means guru or teacher. Well, let me tell you something. If you follow this Akarsha S, this guru is going to lead you straight to hell. Her actual name is D. Murdoch. But, you know, Akarsha sounds so much more spiritual. You know, she's probably getting in touch with her inner child as we speak. Possibly even contemplating her navel. I don't know. Throughout the remainder of this paper, the author will be referred to as Miss Murdoch. The thesis of the Christ conspiracy is that pagans and Jews who were Masons from the 1st and 2nd centuries got together and invented the account of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's so. And his disciples in order to create a religion which it hoped would serve as a one world religion for the Roman Empire. Now, we've already talked about how the Roman Empire and the Roman Catholic Church figures into this. Okay, so that's a very important key to the puzzle. I think that was on part one. But, um, so make sure that you listen to all three parts of this teaching. This religion would be a a collage of all other world religions and combined with astrology. Well, that's exactly what the one world religion of the Antichrist is going to be, and most likely the Catholic Church is going to be the head of the whore. Okay? This, of course, is a radical and unorthodox picture of Bible-believing Christianity. However, being radical and unorthodox does not invalidate a view. Notwithstanding, if Miss Murdoch's picture of Christianity is to be believed as correct. She has to be accurate in her assessment of the details of the other religions she cites in terms of the similarities with Christianity. Because that's what they do in the zeitgeist. They constantly compare Hinduism, Buddhism, paganism with Christianity. But like I said before, she doesn't even get her paganism remotely correct. Okay, so... 
She has to be correct, though, in order for the movie to have validity, right? Isn't that fair? She needs to be correct in her assessment of ancient astrology, correct in her peculiar datings of the Gospels, and must be correct regarding her teachings on the Freemasons. If she is incorrect in any one of these, her hypotheses must be altered or abandoned. It is when we look at the areas of astrology, comparative religion, New Testament higher criticism, Freemasonry, and other issues, we find her to be incorrect in every single one of these areas. Every one. Astrology. This is one area. Miss Murdoch claims, and remember, she's the one that wrote Christ Conspiracy that the Zeitgeist movie was based off. Miss Murdoch claims that as myth developed, it took the form of a play with a cast of characters including 12 divisions of the sky called the signs of the constellations of the zodiac. The symbols that typified these 12 celestial sections of 300 each were not based on what the constellations actually look like, but represent aspects of earthly life. Thus, the ancient peoples were all able to incorporate these earthly aspects into the mythos and project them onto the all-important celestial screen. End of quote. Based on this understanding, she claims that the mythical Jesus recognized the coming of the age of Pisces, the fish, thus the Christian fish. Now, every single thing here that I'm getting into now is massively referenced, okay? This isn't opinion, this is basically documented references. It is true that astrology played a large part in the formation, no, if it is true, or no, is it true that astrology played a large part in the formation of Christianity, as, as Ms. Murdoch asserts? Now, I've already went into the fact that the Bible clearly condemns astrology. Okay? Noel Swerdlow is a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Chicago. He has specialized in the study of the practice of astronomy in antiquity through the 17th century. I emailed Dr. Swerdlow on this manner. Now, in other words, he's emailing an expert in the field of astrology. This is all this guy does. He lives and breathes astrology. I think that's a guy I'd want to go to if I wanted to know something about astrology. Is that fair enough? I'm not saying he's not pagan. I'm not saying he's saved. But he's going to know a lot about astrology. Fair there. So he's a doctor. He emailed Dr. Swordlow. Here's what Dr. Swordlow had to say about Mrs. Murdoch's view on the Christ conspiracy of astrology. In antiquity, constellations were just groups of stars, and there were no borders separating the region one from another. In astrology, for computational purposes, the zodiacal signs were taken as 12 arcs of 30 degrees measured from the vernal equinox. Because of the slow westward motion of the equinoxes and solstices, what we call today the procession of the equinoxes, these did not correspond to the constellations with the same names. But, within groups of stars, the vernal equinox was located, was no astrological significance at all. The modern ideas about the age of Pisces and the age of Aquarius are based upon the location of the vernal equinox in the regions of the stars of those constellations. But the regions, the borders between those constellations, are a completely modern convention of the International Astronomical Union for the purpose of mapping. Do you hear what I just said? I said all that to say the one line. These constellations are, com are a completely modern convention of the International Astrolo Astronomical Union for the purpose of mapping and have never had any astronomical, astrological significance in times past. I hope this is helpful, though... Although, in truth, what this woman is claiming is so wacky that it's hardly worth even answering... So when this woman says that the Christian fish was a symbol of the coming age of Pri Pisces, she is saying something that no one would have thought of in antiquity because in which of in antiquity because in which constellation in which the constellation of fixed stars, the vernal equinox was located, was no significance and it is entirely an idea of modern 20th century astrology. In other words, these things that they say go back all these hundreds and thousands of years to all these other pagan cultures with astrology, a lot of this stuff wasn't even invented until the modern day age. And, and let's face it, they didn't have the, the telescopes and the things that we have now. So, that's from an astronomist. Okay? Okay. In other words, the ancient Christ conspirators could not have recognized the 12 celestial sections in order to incorporate them into the Christian myth and announce the ushering in of the age of Pisces, as Murdoch claims. Because the division into the celestial, celestial sections did not occur until a meeting of the International Astronomical Union in the 20th century. 
Therefore, her claim is without any merit. Miss <coughs> Murdoch also holds that when we see the twelve figures in the Bible, that these are representatives of the twelve zodiacal signs. She writes, in reality, there is no accident that there are twelve patriarchs, twelve tribes of Israel, twelve disciples, twelve numbers on the astrological signs. End of quote. If we want to accept her thoughts on this, we also need to accept that Dunkin' Donuts is owned by an astrologer, since they give a discount when you buy a dozen donuts. Grocery stores must also be run by astrologers, since you can buy a dozen eggs from them. Even our legal system must have been influenced by astrology, since there are 12 jurors. And when, when you want to see astrology in something, you see it. Even when it requires that you read foreign meanings into the text. I kind of like the way this guy writes. But there are further problems with their thesis. Were the 12 tribes of Israel representatives of the 12 signs of the Zodiac, as she claims? She asserts that Simon, Simeon, and Levi are Gemini, Judah is Leo, and the list goes on. She also claims that when Jacob set up 12 stones representing the 12 tribes, that they were really representing the 12 tribes of the Zo- or 12 signs of the Zodiac. But this is impossible. Genesis was written in 1000 BC and contains the story of the 12 tribes of Israel, which would have occurred even earlier. The division into the 12 zodiacal signs did not occur until the Babylonians made the divisions in the 5th century BC. Therefore, reading astrology into the 12 tribes is achronistic. Chronistic. It's not chronologically sound. It doesn't make any sense. She also claims the Hebrews were moon worshippers, since many of their feasts and holidays revolved around the movements and the phases of the moon. Such moon worship is found repeatedly in the Old Testament. Now she, she cites where, it's, where, it's, where the, the uh, Israelites were, um, the Hebrews, were worshipping the moon. The first place she cites it is Psalm 8.13. So let's go to Psalm 8.13. I thought this was kind of neat, neat, neat way to really show her scholarly uh, thing here. I mean, this really, this will get your attention. Let's go to Psalm 8, 13. I'm going to let everybody get there. <laughs> the first verse she cites to prove that the Hebrews were, you know, big time star worshippers doesn't exist. There is no Psalm 8.13. It ends at verse 9. (laughs) So, you know, okay, okay, we'll we'll give her that one. Come on. We'll we'll give her that one. I mean, she can't get her paganism right. You can't expect her to get her Bible right either. So let's go to the next verse she cites. Psalm 104, verse 19. You know, I'll actually use the very verses that she's trying to use To prove my point. Psalm 104, verse 19. He, meaning God, appointed the moon for seasons, and the sun, knoweth, is going down. How does that prove that that the Hebrews were star worshippers? How does that prove that? Can you tell me that? It said that God appointed the moon for the seasons, and the sun, knoweth, is going down. Okay... Okay, let's go to Isaiah 66.23. That's the next verse she cites. Isaiah 66, verse 23. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth... uh, Okay, this is the end of Isaiah. Okay, let's let's go ahead and read verse uh, 22. As for the new heavens and the new earth will I make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed. Now this is in regard to, like, the millennium and afterward, these types of things. Okay, but where does it say here that they're worshipping the moon? It says, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come together and worship before me, meaning God. They're not going to worship the moon or the stars. How does that prove her point? It doesn't. She, she's, she's discrediting herself at every turn here. And this discreditation equally applies to the Zeitgeist movie. So, let's go forward. And to this day, Jews... Um, uh, she goes on to say that, and to this day, Jews celebrate holidays based on the lunar calendar. And Isaiah... 
47, these moon worshippers are equated with astrologers who divide the heavens, who gaze at the stars, who at new moons predict what shall befall before you. Okay, now let's go there. Isaiah 47. I'm not going to back away from anything that, she, that this woman's bringing up. Isaiah 47. Let's start in verse 12. Stand now with thine enchantments, and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If it so be that thou shalt may be able to profit, if so be thou mayest prevail. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers and the stargazers and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things which shall come upon thee. God's like mocking them. He's challenging them. He said, let them try to save you. We'll see what happens. Behold, they shall be a stubble, and fire shall burn them, and they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall, there shall not be a coal to warm, nor fire to sit before. Now, I know we already made reference to this, but how does... They're saying, basically what they're saying here, what she's trying to say, is that in the Bible, it's as though God encouraged moon worshipping. He's condemning it here. I'm not saying there weren't certain sects of the Jews that lapsed into this. Every single pagan culture has always lapsed into pagan has always lapsed into paganism. But God doesn't condone it. He condemns it. It's ridiculous. The the, the way that she goes about this is, is the opposite way she should be. But you know, she's got to push her agenda some way. This is about apostate Jews. Not biblical Jews. Okay? Listen to this. If you go to the verse 1 of Isaiah 47, it says, Come and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Now, I heard one guy say, well, this isn't even talking about the Jews. I disagree. Because you make, it says in verse 4, As for our Redeemer, the Lord God of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Now, what this is, is it's apostate Israel. Apostate Israel is many times referred to in the Bible as the daughter of Babylon. It's not Babylon, it's the daughter of Babylon. The whorish daughter of Babylon. Many, many times apostate Israel is referred to that. Okay? So, let's go further. We're the Hebrews moon worshippers. This is unfounded for a couple reasons. Number one, just because the Jews operated under a lunar calendar doesn't mean that they were moon worshippers. When you look at the three Bible references she provides, which we just looked at, to support her claim that moon worship is found repeatedly in the Old Testament, it is readily, it is readily seen that these verses she's citing are totally taken out of context. The one didn't even exist. And all we ever see of moon worship is condemnation by the Lord Jesus, by, by the Lord. So let's go further. So, we have seen that the three passages Miss Murdoch appeals to in her support of her thesis that the Hebrews were involved in moon worship do not support her view in the least. Rather, they have been taken out of context a practice referred to as proof texting. Unfortunately, average readers will not look up her references and see this for themselves. Somebody watching the zeitgeist, that are, most people are lazy. Most people will not explore or seek a matter or search a matter out or be like the Bereans in Acts, which is said they sought the things out in Scripture to see if they'd be so. They sought them out daily. They don't want to do that. This is not to say that there was not a single apostate Hebrew who worshipped the moon. Obviously there were. That's why God called them the daughter of Babylon. Because they had lapsed in. I mean, the Old Testament is rife with references to apostate Jew Jews. Okay? But her absurd interpretations, Miss Murdoch's absurd interpretations, indicate that she has not supported her view that the Hebrews, as a nation, had a practice of moon worshipping, especially one ordained by God. This is further confirmed by the fact that the worship of anyone or anything other than God was prohibited. Remember, God said, I am a God, I am a jealous God, I will have no other gods before thee. Bow that, don't bow yourself down to graven images or to idols, which have eyes but cannot see and have ears but cannot hear and have mouths but they cannot speak. Wherever this practice is mentioned in the Bible, there is a correction or a strong condemnation. Contrary to Miss Murdoch, the Bible is not friendly toward astrology. I think we've proven that amply. 
There is not a single verse that prove, approves of sun worship, moon worship, or astrology. Miss Murdoch also claims that the Bible is favorable toward divination. What Bible is she reading? She writes in the earliest parts of the Bible, she writes, quote, in the earliest parts of the Bible, divination is praised as a way to commune with God or divine the future. Okay, where does she say this happens? Oh, Genesis thirty twenty seven. Well let's go there. She's more pathetic in, in, in her in her assessment of the Bible than she is of the paganism. She can't get anything right. You talk about lies. Genesis 30.27 And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if thou hast find favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. Okay, this is about Jacob and Laban. Okay. Uh, okay, now let's see here. Let's go back over this again. Miss Murdoch claims the Bible is favorable towards divination. She writes, in the earliest parts of the Bible, divination is praised in a way to commune with God or divine the future. Genesis thirty twenty seven. Did you see anything in that verse I just read? And Laban said, I pray thee, if I found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. Because of Jacob's presence in Laban's family, the Lord was blessing Laban's family. He liked it. How is that divination? I, you can't... But see, it's almost like she's throwing out verses that don't even apply, hoping you won't look them up. I mean, that is pathetic. Indeed, the word divination comes from the word divine, which is a demonstration that divination was originally considered godly and not evil. This, okay, this is what she's saying. Divination comes from the word divine, which is a demonstration that divination was originally considered godly and not evil. But that's kind of funny because the Bible totally condemns divination every single time it's mentioned. And the penalty was death in the Old Testament. This is just her opinions. This too is an incorrect understanding of the text. Genesis 30.27 records Laban telling Jacob that he has learned through divination that God has blessed him on Jacob's account. But Laban was known to worship other gods. But he doesn't even do that! How does that, how does he even, I mean, this guy writing this is even wrong. Laban telling Jacob that he has learned that through divination that God is, where does it say that in verse 27? Maybe it says it in a false version. But it don't say it in the King James. Okay? In fact, it wouldn't even matter because Laban is his own person anyway. He's not God. He's an imperfect man. But it doesn't even say that. This verse does not praise divination, and God has said elsewhere that divination is evil. For example, it is written in, in Leviticus 19.26. Let's just go there real quick. Leviticus 19.26. You shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall you use enchantments, nor observe times. Observe times is like astrology, divination. These types of things. Likewise, in Deuteronomy 18, verse 10, Deuteronomy 18, verse 10, we spent a lot of time in this, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh a son, or his daughter to pass through the fire, child sacrifice, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. All of them are equated on the same level. All of them were the death penalty. Okay? So don't, please don't come back to me and say the Bible condones divination because it doesn't. It condemns it. I mean, talk about a leap of logic. Miss Murdoch says a lot more in her reference to astrology and the Bible, which this short paper cannot address. However, it is hoped that these few samples are adequate to demonstrate that she is terribly inaccurate in her understanding of the practice of astrology among the ancients, as well as her ineptness in using the Bible to support her view. She can't get either one right. Not even remotely. This woman should be absolutely, totally ashamed of herself. She should crawl under a rock somewhere. And beg God to forgive her. And recant and renounce this heresy. Let's go further. Miss Murdoch contends that Jesus, as a crucified Savior, was merely borrowed from other religions. For her, one of the most striking similarities is found with Krishna. The Hindu God. Indeed, her forthcoming book. She's got a new book coming out, everyone. So just make sure you're first in line. 
Her new forthcoming book, The Sons of God, Krishna, Buddha, and Christ Unveiled, I can hardly wait to miss it, expounds on this position of Krishna. What about Miss Burnock's claim that Krishna is so similar to Jesus Christ that Christianity must have borrowed from Hinduism? Dr. Edward Bryan, professor of Hinduism. Now, one thing I love about this guy is he goes right to the professors that live and breathe a particular subject. I'm not saying they're saved, but if anybody's going to know something about it, it's going to be a professor of Hinduism. This guy is Dr. Edward Bryan, professor of Hinduism at Rutgers University, a scholar on Hinduism. As the writing of this paper, he has just translated the Bhagavad Gita the Bhagavad Purana, the life of Krishna, for Paraguayan world classics. So if anybody's going to know about the life of Krishna, this guy's going to. Okay? And he's currently writing a book to be titled The Quest of the Historical Krishna. When I informed him that Miss Murdoch wrote an article claiming that Krishna had been crucified, he replied, that is an absolute and complete nonsense. This is a quote. There is absolutely no mention anywhere which alludes to a crucifixion of Krishna. End of quote. He also added that Krishna was killed by an arrow from a hunter who accidentally shot him in the heel. Again, it sounds like repackaged Achilles, Achilles' heel. The sages, um, okay, he died and ascended. It was not a resurrection. The sages who came there for him could not see it. Then I read a statement by Miss Murdoch from her article, Krishna Crucified, an excerpt from her forthcoming book, Sons of God, Krishna, Buddha, and Christ Unveiled. In it, she states, quote, it appears Krishna is not the first Indian god depicted as crucified. Prior to him was another incarnation of Vishnu, the avatar named Watoba, who often had been identified with Krishna. To this, Bryant responds, and this is this Hindu scholar, to this he responds, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Vith Vithoba was a form of Krishna worshipped in the state of of Maharashtra, whatever that is. There are absolutely no Indian gods portrayed as crucified. End of quote. He then became indignant and said, quote, if someone is going to go on the air and make statements about, a, about religious tradition, they should at least read a Religion 101 course. End of quote. That's what this Hindu scholar thinks about the person, this, this Miss Murdoch who wrote the Christ Conspiracy, which is what the Zeitgeist movie is totally based on. Later, I emailed him regarding the 24 comparisons of Krishna to Jesus, which she has in this thing, which the reader may find in the Christ Conspiracy. He stated that 14 out of the 24 comparisons from Krishna to Christ are completely wrong, and a 15th is partially wrong. What about her 9 that are correct? Especially Krishna's virgin birth, the story of a tyrant who had been thousands, the story of the tyrant who had thousands of infants killed, and Krishna's bodily ascension. Benjamin Walker, in his book, The Hindu World, an encyclopedic survey of Hinduism, provides the answer. After tracing similarities related to the birth, childhood, and divinity of Jesus, as well as the late dating of these legendary developments in India, remote, notice I said late dating of these developments in, in, in India, there can be no doubt that the Hindus borrowed the tales from Christianity, but not in the same name. Bryant also comments that these parallels come from the Bhagavad Gita Pur Purana and the Haramasa. Bryant believes that the former to be prior to the 7th century AD, yet this is hundreds of years after the Gospel accounts. In other words, all this came after Jesus Christ. They could have easily borrowed from this and plagiarized it. Okay? Of the Haramasa, Bryant is uncertain as to its date, however, most sources seem to place its composition between the 4th and 6th centuries, again, hundreds of years after the Gospel accounts had been in circulation. An earlier date is entertained by David Mason of the University of Wisconsin, who states there is no consensus on the dating, but he's aware uh, that uh, it may be as early as 2nd century. Even if this date, even if this early date is accurate, it is still after the Gospels, not before his murder thesis requires. Miss Murdoch further claims that Christianity has failed in India because the Brahmins have recognized Christianity as a relatively recent imitation of their much older traditions. To which this Dr. Bryant simply stated, stupid comment, end of quote. See, this is a, this is a pagan Hindu guy who owns the subject of Krishna better than probably anybody on the planet, saying that this woman is, is out of her mind, essentially. Her, her, her information or research is stupid. 
Miss Smyrna claims that Christianity has borrowed substantially from Hinduism is without merit. Her claims are without merit. Her claims are false, unsupported, and exhibit a lack of understanding of the Hindu religion. Now, let's talk about her similarities of Christ to Buddha. In addition to Krishna, Miss Murdoch states cites that similarities between Buddha and Jesus as an example of how Christianity is borrowed from Buddhism. Right. As with Krishna, she lists 18 similarities between Jesus shares with Buddha in the Christ conspiracy. Regarding these, I emailed, again, he emails an expert, Professor Chun Fong Yu. I had a brother named Chun Fong Yu. No, just kidding, sorry. Professor Chun Fong Yu, chair, chairman of the Department of Religion at Rutgers. Dr. Yu has specialized in Buddhist studies. I listed the 18 similarities recorded by Miss Murdoch and asked if these were actually traditions of Buddha. Now, this guy is going to the fountainheads of information on paganism, okay? These guys own this stuff. So, what was, what was Dr. Fu, or Yu's, sorry, Fu Yu, sorry. What was Dr. Yu's response? Okay? <laughs> she replied, quote, None of the 18 similarities are correct. None! None! A few, however, have some semblance of correctness, but they are badly distorted. End of quote. Dr. Yu ended by writing, This woman you speak of, this Miss Murdoch, is totally ignorant of Buddhism. It is very dangerous to spread information, misinformation like this. You should not honor Miss Murdoch by engaging even in a discussion with her. Please ask her to take a basic course in world religion or Buddhism before uttering another world about things she does not know. End of quote. Oh boy, this Zeitgeist movie is just, it's all over it. So accurate. This is the second time Miss Murdoch has been asked to take a basic 101 course in religion. She gets everything wrong. It is appropriate to mention here that Miss Murdoch's claim have to be mastered several, it is appropriate here to mention that Miss Murdoch claims to have mastered several religions. Oh yeah, she's, she's real master. Legend in her own mind. Uh, her book, The Christ Conspiracy, claims a mastery of Christianity. Oh, we've seen her ma oh, she quoting that psalm that didn't even exist. That was a good one. Um, her master of Christianity and her new book, The Sons of God, Krishna, Buddha, and Christ and Veil, with excerpts found on her website, also indicate that she believes Hinduism and Buddhism to be two other religions which she mastered in terms of her knowledge of them. I think that would be contrary to these Hindu and Buddhist scholars that just respond to her. However, as we have seen, she is terribly ignorant of the actual, most elementary traditions of Hinduism and Buddhism. As we are about to see, she is likely mistaken when it comes to her understanding of Christianity. Okay, so, what, is she, what does she say about Christianity? As we saw in section 1, astrology, that Miss Murdoch, um, Murdoch does not use biblical texts in an accurate manner to support her views. In this section, we will notice that she also possesses some peculiar views when it comes to the New Testament higher criticism. Can these views be supported? Well, she, she makes this case that the very late datings of the Gospels. Miss Murdoch holds that the Gospels were not penned until after 150 A.D., a view held by no major New Testament scholar, irrespective of their theological perspective, she supports her position by quoting John's, John Reamsberger, who wrote, quote, The four Gospels were unknown to the early Christian fathers. Justin Martyr, the most eminent of all early church fathers, wrote about the middle of the second century. His writings in proof, his writings in proof of the divinity of Christ demanded that demanded the use of these Gospels. Had they existed in his time, he makes more than 300 quotations from the books of the Old Testament and nearly 100 from the apocryphal books of the New Testament, but none of the other four Gospels. Now, this is what she's using to back up what she's saying. But this is false. The Justin, in Justin's first apology, Justin Martyr, called the First Defense, he writes, for the apostles in their memoirs composed by them, which are called Gospels, which are called Gospels, have thus delivered unto us what was enjoined unto them, that Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, said, do this in remembrance of me, this is my body, and that, after the same manner, having taken the cup and given thanks, he said, this is my blood, and gave it to them alone. So Justin calls the Gospels the memoirs of the apostles, and then quotes from them. But this guy said he would never ever did that. Well, he's a liar. In his dialogue with Typho, 
Justin makes mention of the memoirs another 13 times. In every instance, he either quotes from a gospel or relates a story from them. Why is it that Justin does not cite the gospels when defending the deity of Christ? He is dialoguing with a Jew and wants to use the Old Testament scriptures to defend his position, since he shares these in common with Typho. This is also the practice of Paul. Now, and this is a Bible verse, Now when they had traveled through Amophilus and Aponia, then they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews, and according to Paul's custom, he went to them for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the scriptures. He was reasoning with the Jews, with Old Testament scriptures, in order to validate and prove that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Messiah the Old Testament clearly predicted. Okay? As further, support, it, as further support, she cites Charles Waite. At the very threshold of the subject, we are met by the fact that nowhere in all the writings of Justin does he once so much mention any of these Gospels. Now this is her, her supposedly, how she's justifying this. Nor does he mention either of their supposed authors, except for John. It is true that Justin never says who wrote them. However, contrary to Murdoch's sources, we know that they existed because Justin referred to them and quoted them just as we demonstrated above. Miss Murdoch could claim that the Gospels Justin referred to were different than the four we have, but if this is the case, what data can she provide to support her view? She must also adequately explain why there's a complete absence of manuscripts for these, these supposed Gospels that, you know, she says um, uh, were, were different. She must also explain why there's a complete absence of manuscripts for these, while we have an abundant number of manuscripts for the four Gospels that we now have. Moreover, the Gospels, Justin appeals to seemingly have the precisely the same content as the four we have now. So, she will have difficulty demonstrating that multiple layers of legend were added from Justin's time until the later part of the 2nd century, since the early sources which Justin was familiar with and from which the four Gospels supposedly borrowed said precisely the same things. So she goes further and she says, um, she writes that no, none, uh, she says this guy named Waite, Charles Waite says, no one of the four Gospels is mentioned in any other part of the New Testament. End of quote. So, he goes on to say that there is no other evidence of a Gospel until the later part of the 2nd century. But this is false as well. Paul appears to quote from Luke's Gospel in 1 Timothy 4.18, um, Luke 10.7, The oldest manuscript we have is a fragment from the Gospel of John, which dates to around A.D. 125, which is called P52. It's kept at John Reinhardt's Library in Manchester, England. The early church father, Ignatius, A.D. 110, who either knew the apostles or was close to those who did, seems very familiar with the Gospel of Matthew because of the numerous parallels and apparent quotations from Matthew. Clement and Polycarp, who also knew the apostles, also make the use of Matthew. Second Clement employs numerous sayings from Matthew, Luke, and a few from Mark. All of these early Christian writers were from the later part of the first century, though no later than the middle part of the 2nd century. Therefore, her claim that the Gospels were not composed until the later part of the 2nd century is without support. And there, are, there is no respected New Testament critical scholars who embrace her datings. Murdoch quotes from the Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets. Well, that sounds like a pretty accurate thing there. Sounds like a solid source to me. So Murdoch quotes from this Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets, quote, No extant manuscript can be dated earlier than the 4th century. All right. This shows no knowledge of the manuscripts we have. The P52 papyrus mentioned a moment ago dates back to around 125. The P75 date back, dates back to 175 to 225. The P46 and P66 are slightly earlier and both date to around 200. The P45, the first of the Chester Beatty biblical papyri, dates to the first half of the 3rd century. The P47 dates to the later part of the 3rd century. P72 dates to around the 3rd century. In summary, we have seven manuscripts which predate the 4th century. Oh, but that's contrary to the Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets. So I guess, you know, you're just going to have to make up your mind on that one. Also, another point to bring up. The manuscripts that were the most true and the most used were also the ones that were, again, the most used. And these manuscripts wore out the quickest because they were used. 
the Catholic Church will say, well, we have the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, and they're the oldest manuscripts. The reason they were the oldest manuscripts is because people, even in the Roman Catholic Church, at the time when they were put out, knew that they were heresy and junk, and didn't even mess with them. Until later, Westcott and Hort came along, two basic occultists, and came and said, hey, we're going to translate these into the Bible which ultimately turned into the Revised Version of 1881, which ultimately spawned all the modern translations today, other than the King James Bible. And that's including the New King James. So if you have a, any version other than the uh, King James Bible, you've essentially got a Bible translated from a cult, by a cultist, from essentially a cult, perverted, corrupted manuscripts, which can actually trace their lineage back to Egypt. That's a whole other rabbit trail. The last thing is Paul's letters. This woman, Miss Murdoch, believes that all Paul's letters are forgeries. Now, there's a huge movement in Christianity to to that says this. Oh, Paul! They call Paul the usurper. None of his. See again, it's it's a matter of people don't want to be accountable to a holy God, so they just automatically. Oh, Paul's bad. He's bad. So she believes that all Paul's letters are forgeries. In support of this position, she quotes Joseph Wheelis, the entire. Joseph Wheelis says the entire Pauline group is of the same forged class. Oh, is that so? And then it says in the Encyclopedia Biblica, with respect to the canonical Pauline epistles, there are none of them by Paul, neither 14, nor 13, nor 9, nor 8, nor yet even the 4, so long universally regarded as unassailable. They are, without distinction, false writings. So, she quotes from Chaim ben Yeshua, you know, Yeshua, who writes, quote, We are left with the conclusion that all the Pauline epistles are pseudographic, pseudo-pigographic, and he also refers to Paul as a semi-mythical figure. Again, this is a position that no major scholar takes. Polycarp, who, of, of 110 AD, who knew the apostles, quotes 1 Corinthians 6.2, which is a Pauline writing, and assigns it as the words of Paul. Um, Philippians 11, or, or in Philippians. Three of the earliest apostolic Paul fathers, two of whom probably knew the apostles, mentioned Paul in their writings. This is Clement of Rome, Polycarp of Ignatius. They mentioned several things about Paul, including his suffering, his martyrdom, his position as an apostle. All this is referenced when I'm telling you. And that he accurately and reliably taught the word Moreover, the Apostolic Fathers cite several of Paul's letters, Romans 1, Corinthians um, 1 and 2, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and 1 Timothy. Therefore, there is solid evidence to believe that Paul was a historical person who authored several of the um, uh, books of the Bible, which are contained in the New Testament. No serious scholar takes this position, takes the position of Miss Murdoch, and there are good reasons why. So that's all we have for today. Hopefully that if you were a on the fence about this or an unbeliever, hopefully we've given you enough. There's more up there. You can go up to that answeringinfidels.com. He, he, he refutes the whole book point by point. Okay? Um, so I, I, I pray that... Um, um, that he's given us all eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive this day. I'll go ahead and close this out in a word of prayer here. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that you've given us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you that you've allowed us to assemble today. Thank you, Lord God, for the people that are listening to this recording. I do pray, God, that you bless them, Lord God, and that you do give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive, Lord God, that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart will be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you would cleanse us of presumptuous sins and secret faults, that they would not have dominion over us. In the name of Jesus Christ, if there's any spirit of pride over us, Lord God, that would cause us to not see, that would blind us, I pray, Lord God, all these spirits be removed. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord God, that you would help us and conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, Lord God, you would forgive us for any and all sins that we've committed in any way, shape, or form. That you would wipe our slate clean. That there would be nothing that would hinder our communication, Lord God, with thee. We love you, Lord God. We thank you for all your goodness and mercy. We ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.